My Nightmare by John James Peart All day my nightmare in my thought I keep Spellbound, it seemed, by some magician's charm A giant slumbered on my slothful arm His great, slow breathings jarred the land of sleep Like far-off thunder, rumbling low and deep Lifting his brawny bosom, bronzed and warm When lo! A voice shook me with stern alarm. Who art thou here that dost not sow nor reap? Behold the sleeping servant of thy day. Arouse him to thy deed. If thou but break his slumberous spell, awake he will obey. I lifted up my voice and cried, Awake! And I awoke. My arm, unnerved, lay dead. A useless thing beneath my sleeping head. My Birthday, 1863 End of My Nightmare by John James Piet The Dream by Edna St. Vincent Millay Love, if I weep, it will not matter, And if you laugh, I shall not care. Foolish am I to think about it, But it is good to fill you there. Love, in my sleep I dreamed of waking. White and awful the moonlight reached. Over the floor and somewhere, somewhere, there was a shutter loose. It screeched. Swung in the wind and no wind blowing, I was afraid and turned to you. Put out my hand to you for comfort and you were gone, cold, cold as dew. Under my hand the moonlight lay. Love, if you laugh, I shall not care. But if I weep, it will not matter. Ah, it is good to fill you there. End of the Dream by Edna St. Vincent Millay A Curious Dream Night before last, I had a singular dream. I seemed to be sitting on a doorstep, in no particular city perhaps, ruminating. And the time of night appeared to be about twelve or one o'clock. The weather was balmy and delicious, there was no human sound in the air, not even a footstep. There was no sound of any kind to emphasize the dead stillness except the occasional hollow barking of a dog in the distance and the fainter answer of a further dog. Presently, up the street I heard a bony clack-clacking and guessed it was the castanets of a serenading party. In a minute more, a tall skeleton, hooded and half-clad in a tattered and moldy shroud, whose shreds were flapping about the ribby latticework of its person, swung by me with a stately stride and disappeared in the gray gloom of the starlight. It had a broken and worm-eaten coffin on its shoulder and a bundle of something in its hand. I knew what the clack-clacking was then. It was this party's joints working together and his elbows knocking against his sides as they walked. I may say I was surprised. Before I could collect my thoughts and enter upon any speculations as to what this apparition might portend, I heard another one coming, for I recognized his click-clack. He had two-thirds of a coffin on his shoulder and some foot and headboards under his arm. I mightily wanted to peer under his hood and speak to him, but when he turned and smiled upon me, with his cavernous sockets and his projecting grin as he went by, I thought I would not detain him. He was hardly gone when I heard the clacking again, and another one issued from the shadowy half-light. This one was bending under a heavy gravestone and dragging a shabby coffin after him by a string. When he got to me, he gave me a steady look for a moment or two, then rounded to and backed up to me, saying, Ease this down for a fellow, will ya? I eased the gravestone down till it rested on the ground, and in doing so, noticed that it bore the name of John Baxter Kopmanhurst, with May 1839 as the date of his death. Deceased sat wearily down by me and wiped his osphorontus with his major maxillary, 
chiefly from former habit, I judged, for I could not see that he brought away any perspiration. It's too bad, too bad, said he, drawing the remnant of the shroud about him and leaning his jaw pensively on his hand. Then he put his left foot up on his knee and fell to scratching his ankle bone absently with a rusty nail which he got out of his coffin. What is too bad, friend? Oh, everything, everything. I almost wish I never had died. You surprise me. Why do you say this? Has anything gone wrong? What is the matter? Matter? Look at this shroud rags. Look at this gravestone all battered up. Look at that disgraceful old coffin. All a man's property going to ruin and destruction before his eyes. And ask him if anything is wrong? Fire and brimstone. Calm yourself, calm yourself, I said. It is too bad. It is certainly too bad. But then I had not supposed that you would much mind such matters situated as you are. Well, my dear sir, I do mind them. My pride is hurt. My comfort is impaired. Destroyed, I might say. I will state my case. I will put it to you in such a way you can comprehend it, if you will let me. Said the poor skeleton, tilting the hood of his shroud back as if he were clearing for action, and thus unconsciously giving himself a jaunty and festive air, very much at variance with the grave character of his position in life, so to speak, and in prominent contrast with his distressful mood. Proceed, said I. I reside in the shameful old graveyard, a block or two above you here, in this street. There, now, I just expected that cartilage would let go. Third rib from the bottom, friend, uh, hitch the end of it to my spine with a string, if you have got such a thing about you. Though a bit of silver wire is a deal pleasanter and more durable and becoming, if one keeps it polished. To think of shredding out and going to pieces in this way, just on account of the indifference and neglect of one's posterity. And the poor ghost grated his teeth in a way that gave me a wrench and a shiver, for the effect is mightily increased by the absence of muffling flesh and cuticle. I reside in that old graveyard and have for these thirty years, and I tell you, things are changed since I first laid this old tired frame there and turned over and stretched out for a long sleep with a delicious sense upon me of being done with bother and grief and anxiety and doubt and fear forever and ever, and listening with comfortable and increasing satisfaction to the sexton's work, from the startling clatter of his first spadeful on my coffin till it dulled away to the faint padding that shaped the roof of my new home. Delicious! My! I wish you could try it tonight. And out of my reverie, deceased fetched me a rattling slap with a bony head. Yes, sir, thirty years ago I laid me down there uh, and was happy, for it was out in the country then, out in the breezy, flowery, grand old woods, uh, and the lazy winds gossiped with the leaves, uh, and the squirrels capered over us and around us, and the creeping things visited us, and the birds filled the tranquil solitude with music. Ah, it was worth ten years of a man's life to be dead then. Everything was pleasant. I was in a good neighborhood, for all the dead people that lived near me belonged to the best families in the city. Our posterity appeared to think the world of us. They kept our graves in the very best condition. The fences were always in faultless repair. Headboards were kept painted or whitewashed, and were replaced with new ones as soon as they began to look rusty or decayed. Monuments were kept upright, uh, railings intact and bright, the rose bushes and shrubbery trimmed, trained, and free from blemish, the walls clean and smooth and graveled. But that day has gone by. 
our descendants have forgotten us. My grandson lives in a stately house built with money made by these old hens of mine, and I sleep in a neglected grave with invading vermin that gnaw my shroud to build them nests withal. I and friends that lie with me founded and secured the prosperity of this fine city, and the stately battling of our loves leaves us to rot in a dilapidated cemetery, for neighbors curse uh, and strangers scoff at. See the difference between the old time and this? For instance, our graves are all caved in now. Our headboards have rotted away and tumbled down. Our railings reel this way and that, with one foot in the air, after a fashion of unseemly levity. Our monuments lean wearily, and our gravestones bow their heads discouraged. There be no ornaments any more, no roses, nor shrubs, nor graveled walks, nor anything that is a comfort to the eye, and even the paintless old board fence that did make a show of holiness sacred from companionship with beasts and the defilement of heedless feet, has tottered till it overhangs the street and only advertises the presence of our dismal resting place, and invites yet more derision to it. And now we cannot hide our poverty and tatters in the friendly woods, for the city has stretched its withering arms abroad and taking us in, and all that remains of the cheer of our old home is the cluster of lugubrious forest trees that stand bored and weary of a city life, with their feet in our coffins, looking into the hazy distance and wishing they were there. I tell you, it's disgraceful. You begin to comprehend? You begin to see how it is? While our descendants are living sumptuously on our money, right around us in the city, we have to fight hard to keep skull and bones together. Bless you, there isn't a grave in our cemetery that doesn't leak, not one. Every time it rains in the night, we have to climb out and roost in the trees, and sometimes we are wakened suddenly by the chilly water trickling down the backs of our necks. Then I tell you, there is a general heaving up of old graves, and kicking over of old monuments, and scampering of old skeletons for the trees. Bless me, if you had gone along there some such nights after twelve, you might have seen as many as fifteen of us, roosting on one limb, with our joints rattling rearly, and the wind wheezing through our ribs. Many a time we have perched there for three or four dreary hours, then come down stiff and chilled through and drowsy, and borrowed each other's skulls to bail out our graves with. If you'll glance up in my mouth, now as I tilt my head back, you can see my headpiece is half full of old dry sediment. How top-heavy and stupid it makes me sometimes. Yes, sir, many a time if you had happened to come along just before the dawn, you'd have caught us bailing out the graves and hanging our shrouds on the fence to dry. <gasps> Why, I had an elegant shroud stolen from there one morning. Think a party by the name of Smith took it that resides in a plebeian graveyard over yonder. I think so, because the first time I ever saw him, he hadn't anything on but a check shirt. And the last time I saw him, which was at a social gathering in the new cemetery, he was the best-dressed corpse in the company. And it is a significant fact that he left when he saw me. And presently an old woman from here missed her coffin, she generally took it with her when she went anywhere because she was liable to take cold and bring on the spasmodic rheumatism that originally killed her if she exposed herself to the night air much. She was named Hotchkiss, Anna Matilda Hotchkiss. You might know her. She has two upper front teeth, is tall, but a good deal inclined to stoop, one rib on the left side gone, 
has one shred of rusty hair hanging from the left side of her head and one little tuft just above and a little forward of her right ear has her under jaw wired on one side where it had worked loose small bone of left forearm gone lost in a fight has a kind of swagger in her gait and a gallus way of going with her arms akimbo and her nostrils in the air has been pretty free and easy and is all damaged and battered up till it looks like a queen's wear crate in ruins maybe you've met her god forbid i involuntarily ejaculated for somehow i was not looking for that form of question and it caught me a little off my guard but i hasten to make amends for my rudeness and say i simply meant i had not had the honor for i would not deliberately speak discourteously of a friend of yours you were saying that you were robbed and it was a shame too but it appears by what is left of the shroud you have on that it was a costly one in its day how did a most ghastly expression began to develop among the decayed features and shriveled integuments of my guest's face and i was beginning to grow uneasy and distressed he told me he was only working up a deep sly smile with a wink in it to suggest about the time he acquired his present garment a ghost in a neighboring cemetery missed one well, this reassured me but i begged him to confine himself to speech thenceforth because his facial expression was uncertain even with the most elaborate care it was liable to miss fire smiling should especially be avoided what he might honestly consider a shining success was likely to strike me in a very different light i said i'd like to see a skeleton cheerful even decorously playful but i did not think smiling was a skeleton's best hold yes friend said the poor skeleton the facts are just as i have given them to you two of these old graveyards the one that i resided in and one further along have been deliberately neglected by our descendants of today until there is no occupying them any longer aside from the osteological discomfort of it and that is no light matter in this rainy weather the present state of things is ruinous to property we have got to move or be content to see our effects wasted away and utterly destroyed now you will hardly believe it but it is true nevertheless that there isn't a single coffin in good repair among all my acquaintances now that is an absolute fact i do not refer to low people who come in a pine box mounted on an express wagon but i am talking about your high-toned silver-mounted burial case your monumental sort that travel under black plumes at the head of a procession and have choice of cemetery lots i mean folks like the jarvises and the bledsoes and burlings and such they are all about ruined the most substantial people in our set they were and now look at them utterly used up and poverty stricken one of the bledsoes actually traded his monument to a late barkeeper for some fresh shavings to put under his head i tell you it speaks volumes for there is nothing a corpse takes so much pride in as his monument he loves to read the inscription he comes after a while to believe what it says of himself and then you may see him sitting on the fence night after night enjoying it epitaphs are cheap and they do a poor chap a world of good after he is dead especially if he had hard luck while he was alive i wish they were used more now i don't complain but confidentially i do think it was a little shabby in my descendants to give me nothing but this old slab of a gravestone and all the more that there isn't a compliment on it it used to have gone to his just reward on it and i was proud when i first saw it but by and by i noticed that whenever an old friend of mine came along he would hook his chin over the railing and pull a long face 
and read along down till he came to that, and then he would chuckle to himself and walk off, looking satisfied and comfortable. So I scratched it off to get rid of those fools. But a dead man always takes a great deal of pride in his monument. Yonder goes half a dozen of the Jarvises now, with a family monument along, and some others and some hired specters went by with his a while ago. Hello, Higgins! Goodbye, old friend! That's Meredith Higgins, died in 44. Belongs to our set in a cemetery. Fine old family. Great-grandmother was an Indian. I am on the most familiar terms with him. He didn't hear me was the reason he didn't answer me. And I am sorry, too, because I would have liked to introduce you. You would admire him. He is the most disjointed, swayed-back, and generally distorted old skeleton you ever saw. He is full of fun. When he laughs, it sounds like rasping two stones together, and he always starts it off with a cheery screech, like raking a nail across a window pane. Hey, Jones! That is old Columbus Jones. Shroud cost four hundred dollars. Entire trousseau, including monument, twenty-seven hundred. This is in the spring of twenty-six. It was enormous style for those days. Dead people came all the way from the Alleghenies to see his things. The party that occupied the grave next to mine remembers it well. Now do you see that individual going along with a piece of headboard under his arm, one leg bone below his knee gone, and not a thing in the world on? That is Barstow Dalhousie, and next to Columbus Jones he was the most sumptuously outfitted person that ever entered our cemetery. We are all leaving. We cannot tolerate the treatment we are receiving at the hands of our descendants. They open new cemeteries, but they leave us to our ignominy. They mend the streets, but they never mend anything that is about us or belongs to us. Look at that coffin of mine. Yet I tell you, in its day, it was a piece of furniture that would have attracted attention in any drawing room in the city. You may have it, if you want it. I can't afford to repair it. Put a new bottom in her, and part of a new top, and a bit of fresh lining along the left side, and you'll find her as about as comfortable as any receptacle of her species you ever tried. No, thanks. No, don't mention it. You have been civil to me, and I would give you all the property I have got before I would seem ungrateful. Now, this winding sheet is a kind of sweet thing in its way. Would you like to? No? Well, just as you say, but I wish to be fair and liberal. There's nothing mean about me. Goodbye, friend. I must be going. I may have a good way to go tonight. Don't know. I only know one thing for certain, and that is that I am on the immigrant trail now, and I'll never sleep in that crazy old cemetery again. I will travel till I find respectable quarters, if I have to hoof it to New Jersey. All the boys are going. It was decided in public conclave last night to emigrate, and by the time the sun rises there won't be a bone left in our old habitations. Such cemeteries may suit my surviving friends, but they do not suit the remains that I have the honor to make these remarks. My opinion is the general opinion. If you doubt it, go and see how their departing ghosts upset things before they started. They were almost riotous in their demonstrations of distaste. Hello, here are some of the Bledsoes, and if you will give me a lift with his tombstone, I guess I will join company and jog along with them. Mighty respectable old family, the Bledsoes. They used to always come out in six-horse hearses and all that sort of thing fifty years ago when I walked these streets in daylight. Goodbye, friend. 
and with his gravestone on his shoulder, he joined the grisly procession, dragging his damaged coffin after him, for notwithstanding he pressed it upon me so earnestly, I utterly refused his hospitality. I suppose that for as much as two hours these sad outcasts went clacking by, laden with their dismal effects, and all that time I sat pitying them. One or two of the youngest and least dilapidated among them inquired about midnight trains on the railways, but the breast seemed unacquainted with that mode of travel, and merely asked about common public roads to various towns and cities, some of which are not on the map now, and vanished from it and from the earth as much as thirty years ago. And some few of them never had existed anywhere but on maps and private ones in the real estate agencies at that. And they asked me about the condition of the cemeteries in these towns and cities, and about the reputation the citizens bore as to reverence for the dead. This whole matter interested me deeply, and likewise compelled my sympathy for these homeless ones. And it all seeming real, and I not knowing it was a dream, I mentioned to one shrouded wanderer an idea that had entered my head to publish an account of this curious and very sorrowful exodus, and said also that I might not describe it truthfully and just as it occurred without seeming to trifle with a grave subject and exhibit an irreverence for the dead that would shock and distress their surviving friends. But this bland and stately remnant of a former citizen leaned him far over my gate and whispered in my ear and said, do not let that disturb you. Um, the community that can stand such graveyards as those we are immigrating from can stand anything a body can say about the neglected and forsaken dead that lie in them. At that very moment a cock crowed, and the weird procession vanished and left not a shred or a bone behind. I awoke and found myself lying with my head out of the bed and sagging downward considerably. A position favorable to dreaming dreams with morals in them, maybe, but not poetry. Note. The reader is assured that if the cemeteries in his town are kept in good order, this dream is not leveled at his town at all, but is leveled particularly and venomously at the next town. End of a Curious Dream by Mark Twain Kublai Khan or A Vision in a Dream A Fragment by Samuel Taylor Coleridge In Sanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf, the sacred river, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground With walls and towers were girdled round, And here were gardens bright with sinuous rills, Where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, And here were forests, ancient as the hills, Enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm Which slanted down the green hill Athwart a cedarn cover, A savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift half-intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flail. Amid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river, five miles meandering with a mazy motion through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. And mid this tumult Kubla heard from far Ancestral voices prophesying war. 
The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song, To such a deep delight twould win me, That with music loud and long I would build that dome in air, That sunny dome, those caves of ice, And all who heard should see them there, And all should cry, Beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. End of Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge The Christmas Dream of Little Childs Justice Star Redfield one Christmas Eve, little child's Estabrook hung his stocking carefully by the chimney corner, and, after saying his prayers, got into bed and soon fell asleep. Charles was a good little boy. He was fond of horses, and took pleasure in feeding them and attending to their wants. On the day previous, a traveller came along. His horse was thirsty, so little child's got a pail, filled it with water, and gave the horse to drink, for which the traveller rewarded him by giving him a shilling. But, although so fond of horses, little Charles was not unmindful to the claims of his sister Lizzie, as she was familiarly called, and, in pleasant weather, would go out to walk with her. In the engraving opposite, they are on their way to school together, and have stopped that he may tie her shoe, which has become unfastened. Charles dreamed that he was in bed, peeping at his stocking over the bedclothes, when he saw a very pleasant-looking old gentleman come down the chimney, on a nice little pony, precisely like the one named Lightfoot that his uncle Ben had promised to give him. It was funny indeed to see the pony slide down feet foremost, and Charles could not help laughing. But he laughed still louder when he examined old Nicholas the rider. His hair was made of crackers, and as he came nearer and nearer to the lamp that stood on the half, pop went one of the crackers, then another, and then another. But St. Nicholas was not a bit frightened. He only rubbed his ears with his coat sleeve patted the pony to keep him quiet, and laughed till he showed the concave of his great mouth, full of sugar plums. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. Charlie laughed when he saw him, in spite of himself, while a wink of his eye, a twist of his head, soon gave him to know he had nothing to dread. Charles was excessively delighted, and shouted so loud that his mother thought he had a nightmare. He watched the old gentleman closely, and then looked at his stocking. It hung very conveniently. He can't put the pony in it, said he to himself. That's a pity. The old gentleman's pockets stood out prodigiously, and he panted and puffed as if he had been cuddling an alligator. Well, said he, wiping the perspiration off his face, although it was the 25th of December. If this is not hard work, eighty-five youngsters have I called on the last hour. Hark, St. Michael's sounds loud down the chimney. One, two... I shall have a tough job from two o'clock till daylight, popping down the chimneys from the battery to the higher bridge. I wonder what this chap will like for a Christmas present, continued he, eyeing the stocking, and then putting his arms akimbo he began to consider. Charles' heart beat. Good Mr. Nicholas, said he to himself, if you could only give me that pony. But he kept quite still, for he saw the old man put his hands into his tremendous pockets. Hmm, let me see, said old Nicholas. Here's a jackknife that I was to have given Tommy Battle, uh, if he had not quarrelled with his sisters. Open sesame! The sucking opened, and in went the jackknife. It was the very thing that Charles wanted. One after another, the old gentleman pulled out tops, twine, marbles, dissected maps, picture books, sugar plums, besides diverse other notions, all the while talking to himself. Hmm, well, this drum, said he, is for Tom Barnwell, a clever little fellow who never tells lies. This pretty little fish hooks in the line, Master Trout must have, for his patient care of his father when he was sick. This mask is for Oris Allen. He must not use it to frighten little children, or I shall remember it when Christmas comes again. Let me see. I will give this globe to Joseph Dudley, who is a studious boy, and he will make a good use of it. This pretty annual was for William Wiley, but the lad kicked his brother and called him a bad name, so I will lay it by for George Wilde. Charles thought he could stay forever to see the old gentleman take out his knick-knacks and tell who they were for, 
but he began to be a little frightened for his own stocking when he recollected that he had been remiss in his Latin the last quarter. "'I hope the old gentleman does not understand the classics,' said Charlie to himself, but he stopped short, for his queer visitor held up the stocking, saying, "'I think this lair laughs gunpowder by the smell of his stocking.' He then took hold of his hair, and pulling out crackers by the dozen from his head, tied them into neat parcels, and threw them into the stocking. As fast as he pulled them off, new crackers appeared and hung down over his ears and forehead. "'This accounts for the noise we hear on Christmas,' said Charles. "'I never knew who made all the crackers.' And he had to hold his sights for laughing, the old man looked so droll. When the old gentleman stooped over the light to put a new supply in the stocking, an unusual number exploded, and the little pony, giving a start up the chimney, disappeared. Charles awoke. It was just daylight. He sprang out of bed, roused all the family with his Merry Christmas, ran to the stable, and what should he see but Uncle Ben's little pony, with a halt on its neck, on which was tied a piece of paper written, A Merry Christmas with the Pony Lightford, for my nephew Charles. End of The Christmas Dream of Little Charles by Justice Star Redfield The Nightmare by William Danby I come in gleams from the land of dreams, wrapped round in the midnight's pall. You may hear my moan in the night wind's groan when the tapestry flaps on the wall. I come from my rest in the death owl's nest where she screams in fear and pain. And my wings gleam bright in the wild moonlight as it whirls round the madman's brain. And down sweeps my car like a falling star while the winds have hushed their breath. When you feel in the air from the cold sepulchre the faint damp smell of death. My vigil I keep by the murderer's sleep, when dreams round his senses spin, and I ride on his breast and trouble his rest in the shape of his deadliest sin, and hollow and low is his moan of woe in the depth of his strangling pain, and his cold black eye rolls in agony and faintly rattles his chain. The sweat drops fall on the dark prison wall. He wakes with a deep-drawn sigh. He hears my tread as I pass from his bed, and he calls on the saints on high. I fly to the bed where the weary head of the poet its rest must seek, and with false dreams of fame I kindle the flame of joy on his pallid cheek. No thought does he take of the world awake and its cold and heartless pleasure. The holy fire of his own loved lyre is his best and dearest treasure. But neglects foul sting that cheek shall bring to a darker and deadlier hue. The last dear token his lyre is broken, and his heart is broken too. When the maiden asleep for her lover may weep afar on the boundless sea, and she dreams he is pressed to her welcome breast, returned from his dangers free, I come in the form of a wave of the storm and sweep him away from her heart, and then, in a dream, she starts with a scream to think that in death they part. And still in the light of her dream-bound sight, the images whirl and dance, till my swift elision dispels the vision, and she wakes as from a trance. With dreams I affright the startled sight of the miser, withered and old, and he strives to arise with horrible cries as he thinks of his stolen gold. But faint is each limb, and ghastly and grim gurgles his stifled gasp, and his sinews I strain on his bed of pain till he faints in my elvish grasp. An awful one with a hand of bone seems to beckon him off to the tomb, and I laugh as I whirl through the night's black furl and the film of the shadowy gloom. When the sweet babe lies with its half-closed eyes as blue as the sky of even, and you know the while by its innocent smile that its dreams are of joy in heaven. I steal to the bed where that gentle head in meek composure lies, and with phantoms of fright I break the light of its visions of paradise. Oh, the horror and fear of that night so drear is long ere it pass away, and the fearful glare of my fiendish stare is remembered for many a day. When the clouds first born of the breezy morn in the eastern chambers roam, I glide away in the twilight gray to rest in my shadowy home, and darkness and sleep to their kingdom sweep, and dreams rustle by like a storm. But where I dwell no man can tell who hath seen my hideous form, whether it be in the caves of the sea where the rolling breakers go, 
or the crystal sphere of the upper air, or the depths of hell below. End of The Nightmare by William Danby Dreamworld, R.A. Lafferty It was the awfulest dream in the world, no doubt about it. In fact, it seemed to be the only dream there was. He was a morning type, so it was unusual that he should feel depressed in the morning. He tried to account for it, and could not. He was a healthy man, so he ate a healthy breakfast. He was not too depressed for that, and he listened unconsciously to the dark girl with a musical voice. Often she ate at Kales in the morning with her girl friend. Grape juice, pineapple juice, orange juice, apple juice. Why did people look at him suspiciously just because he took four or five sorts of juice for breakfast? Agnes, it was ghastly. I was built like a sack. A sack full of skunk cabbage, I swear. And I was a green brown colour and had hair like a latrine mop. Agnes, I was sick with misery. It just isn't possible for anybody to feel so low. I can't shake it at all. And the whole world was like the underside of a log. It wasn't that, though. It wasn't just one bunch of things. It was everything. It was a world where things just weren't worth living. I can't come out of it. Theresa, it was only a dream. Sausage. Only four little links for an order. Do people think he was a glutton because he had four orders of sausage? It didn't seem like very much. My mother was a monster. She was a warthogish animal. And yet she was still recognisable. How could my mother look like a warthog and still look like my mother? Mama's pretty. Therese, it was only a dream. Forget it. The stairs a man must suffer just to get a dozen pancakes on his plate. What was the matter with people who called four pancakes a tall stack? And what was odd about ordering a quarter of a pound of butter? It was better than having twenty of those little pats, each on its coaster. Agnes, we all of us had eyes that backed out, and we stank, we were bloated, and all the time it rained a dirty green rain that smelt like a four-letter word. Good grief, girl! We had hair all over us where we were in warts, and we talked like cracked crows. We had crawlers. I itched just from thinking about it, and the dirty parts of the dream I won't even tell you. I've never felt so blue in my life. I just don't know how I'll make the day through. Teresa doll, how could a dream upset you so much? There isn't a thing wrong with ordering three eggs sunny side up, and three over easy, and three poached ever so soft, and six of them scrambled. What law says a man should have all of his eggs fixed alike? Nor is there anything wrong with ordering five cups of coffee. That way the girl doesn't have to keep running over with refills. Bascom Swice could like to have bacon at waffles after the egg interlude and the earlier courses. But he was nearly at the end of his breakfast when he jumped up. What did you say? He was surprised at the violence of his own voice. What did who say, Mr. Swicegut? That girl that was just here. That just left with the other girl. That was Teresa, and the other girl was Atneys. Or else that was Atneys, and the other girl was Teresa. It depends on which girl you mean. I don't know what either of them said. Bascom ran out into the street. Girl, the girl who sat at rain dirty green all the time. What's your name? My name's Teresa. You've met me four times. Every morning you look like you never saw me before. I'm Agnes, said Agnes. What did you mean that rain dirty green all the time? Tell me about it. I will not, Mr. Swicegut. I was just telling a dream I had to Agnes. It isn't any of your business. Well, I have to hear all of it. Tell me everything you dreamed. I will not. It was a dirty dream. It isn't any of your business. If you weren't a friend of my uncle Aunt Kelly, I'd call a policeman for your bothering me. Uh, did you have things like life rats in your stomach to digest for you? Did they... Oh, how did you know? Get away from me. I will call a policeman. Mr. McCarty, this man is annoying me. The devil he is, miscellaneous. Old Bascom just doesn't have it in him anymore. There's no more harm in him than a lamppost. Uh, did the lamppost have fair on them, Miss Teresa? Did that pant and swell and smell green? Oh, you couldn't know, you awful man. I'm Agnes, said Agnes, but Teresa dragged Agnes away with her. What is the lamppost, Jack, Biscomb? asked Officer Mossback McCarty. Oh, I know what it's like to be in hell, Mossback. I dreamed of it last night. And well, you should. A man who neglects his Easter duty year after year. But the lamppost, Jack, if it concerns anything on my beat, I have to know about it. It seems that I found the shame the pressing dream as a young lady. Identical in every detail. Not knowing what dreams are, and we do not know, we should not find it strange that two people might have the same dream. There may not be enough of them to go around, and most dreams are forgotten in the morning. Bascom Swicegood had forgotten his dismal dream. 
He could not account for a state of depression until he heard Teresa and Aeneas telling pieces of her own dream to Agnes Jonapful. Even then it came back to him slowly at first, but afterwards with a rush. The oddity wasn't that two people should have the same dream, but that they should discover the coincidence. What, with the thousands of people running around and most of the dreams forgotten? Yet, if it were a coincidence, it was a multiplex one. On the night when it was first made manifest, it must have been dreamed by quite a number of people in one medium-large city. There was a small piece in an afternoon paper. One doctor had five different worried patients who had had dreams of rats in their stomachs and hair growing on the insides of their mouth. This was the first publication of the shared dream phenomenon. The script did not mention the foul green rain background, but late investigation uncovered that this and other details were common to the dreams. But it was a reporter named Willie Wagoner who really put the town on the map. Until he did the job, the incidents and notices had been isolated. Dr. Hiram Judas had been putting together some notes on the Green Rain Syndrome, Dr. Florence Appian had been working up his evidence on the Surex ventriculus trauma, and Professor Gideon Greathouse had come to some learned conclusions on the inner meaning of wards. But it was Willie Wagoner who went to the people for it, and then gave his conclusions back to the people. Willie said that he had interviewed a thousand people at random. He hadn't really. He had talked to about twenty. It takes longer than you might think to interview a thousand people. He reported that slightly more than 67% had had a dream of the same repulsive world. He reported that more than 44% had had the dream more than once. 32% more than twice. 27% more than three times. Many had had it every damned night. And many refused frostily to answer questions on the subject at all. This was ten days after Bascom Swisegood had heard Teresa Ananias tell her dream to Agnes. Willie published the opinions of the three learned gentlemen above, and the theories and comments of many more. He also appended a hatful of answers he had received that were sheer levity. But the phenomenon wasn't local. Wagner's article was the first comprehensive, or at least wordy, treatment of it, but only by hours. Similar things were in other papers that very afternoon, and the next day. It was more than a fad. Those who called it a fad fell silent after they themselves experienced the dream. The suicide index arose around the country and the world. The thing was now international. The cacophonous ditty Green Rain was on all the jukes, as was the Warthog song. People began to loathe themselves and each other. Women feared that they should give birth to monsters. There were new perversions committed in the name of the thing, and several orgiastic societies were formed with a stomach rat as a symbol. All entertainment was forgotten. And this was the only topic. Nervous disorders took a fearful rise, as people tried to stay awake to avoid the abomination, and as they slept in spite of themselves and suffered the degradation. It is no joke to experience the same loathsome dream all night every night. It had actually come to that. All the people were dreaming it all night every night. It had passed from being a joke to being a universal menace. Even the sudden new millionaires who rushed the cures to the market were not happy. They also suffered whenever they slept, and they knew that their cures were not cures. There were large amounts posted for anyone who could cure the populace of the warthog people dreams. There was presidential edict and dictator decree, and military teams attacked the thing as a military problem, but they were not able to subdue it. Then, one night, a nervous lady heard a voice in a noisome dream. It was one of the repulsive cracked warthog noises. You are not dreaming, said the voice. This is the real world. But when you wake, you will be dreaming. That bare-faced world is not a world at all. It is only a dream. This is the real world. The lady awoke howling, and she had not howled before, for she was a demure lady. Nor was she the only one who awoke howling. There were hundreds, then thousands, then millions. The voice spoke to all, and engendered a doubt. Which was the real world? Almost equal time was now spent in each, for the people had come to need more sleep, and most of them had arrived at spending a full twelve hours or more in the nightmarish world. It could be, was the title of a headlined article on the subject, but the same Professor Greathouse mentioned above. It could be, he said, that the world on which the green rain fell incessantly was the real world. It could be that the warthogs were real and the people a dream. It could be that rats in their stomachs were normal and other methods of digestion were chimerical. And then a very great man went on the air in worldwide broadcast with a speech that was a ringing call for collective sanity. It was the hour of decision, he said. The decision would be made, things were at an exact balance, and the balance would be tipped. But we can decide. 
One way or the other, we will decide. I implore you all, in the name of sanity, that you decide right. One world or the other will be the world of tomorrow. One of them is real, and one of them is a dream. Both are with us now, and the favour can go to either. But listen to me here. Whichever one wins, the other will have always been a dream, a momentary madness soon forgotten. I urge you to the sanity which, in a measure, I have lost myself. Yet in our dark dilemma, I feel that we yet have a choice. Choose! And perhaps that was the turning point. The mad dream disappeared as suddenly as it had appeared. The world came back to normal with an embarrassed laugh. It was all over. It had lasted from its inception six weeks. Bascombe Swisegood, a morning type, felt excellent this morning. He breakfasted at Kale's, and he ordered heavily as always. And he listened with half an ear to the conversation of two girls at the table next to his. "'But I should know you,' he said. "'Of course, I'm Teresa. I'm Agnes,' said Agnes. "'Mr. Swisegood, how could you forget? It was when the dreams first came, and you overheard me telling mine to Agnes. Then you ran after us in the street, because you had had the same dream, and I wanted to have you arrested. Weren't they horrible dreams?' And have they ever found out what caused them? They were horrible, but they have not found out. They ascribe it a group mania, which is meaningless. And now there are those who say that the dreams never came at all, and soon they will be nearly forgotten. But the horror of them, the loneliness. Yes, we hadn't even pediculi to carry our body hair. We almost hadn't any body hair. Teresa was an attractive girl. She had a cute trick of popping the smallest rat out of her mouth so it could see what was coming into her stomach. She was bulbous and beautiful. Like a sack full of skunk cabbage, Bescott murmured admiringly in his head, and then flushed green at his forwardness of phrase. Teresa had protuberances upon protuberances, and warts on warts, and hair all over hair where she wasn't warts and bums. Like a latrine mop, sighed Bescott with true admiration. The crack clang of Teresa's voice was music in the early morning. All was right with the earth again. Gone the hideous nightmare world, when people had stood barefaced and lonely, without bodily friends or dependents. Gone that ghastly world of the sick blue sky, and the near absence of entrancing odour. Bascomb attacked manfully as played of prime carrion, and outside the pungent green rain fell incessantly. End of Dream World by R. A. Lafferty A Dream of Wild Bees by Olive Schreiner a mother sat alone at an open window. Through it came the voices of the children as they played under the acacia trees, and the breath of the hot afternoon air. In and out of the room flew the bees, the wild bees, with their legs yellow with pollen, going to and from the acacia trees, droning all the while. She sat on a low chair before the table and darned. She took her work from the great basket that stood before her on the table. Some lay on her knee and half covered the book that rested there. She watched the needle go in and out, and the dreary hum of the bees and the noise of the children's voices became a confused murmur in her ears as she worked slowly and more slowly. Then the bees, the long-legged, wasp-like fellows who make no honey, flew closer and closer to her head, droning. Then she grew more and more drowsy, and she laid her hand, with a stocking over it, on the edge of the table and leaned her head upon it and the voices of the children outside grew more and more dreamy, came now far, now near. Then she did not hear them, but she felt under her heart where the ninth child lay. Bent forward and sleeping there, with the bees flying about her head, she had a weird brain picture. She thought the bees lengthened and lengthened themselves out, and became human creatures and moved round and round her. Then one came to her softly, saying, Let me lay my hand upon thy side where the child sleeps. If I touch him, he shall be as I. 
She asked, Who are you? And he said, I am health. Whom I touch will have always the red blood dancing in his veins. He will not know weariness nor pain. Life will be a long laugh to him. No, said another, let me touch, for I am wealth. If I touch him, material care shall not feed on him. He shall live on the blood and sinews of his fellow men, if he will, and what his eye lusts for, his hand will have. He shall not know I want. And the child lay still like lead. And another said, Let me touch him, I am fame. The man I touch I lead to a high hill where all men may see him. When he dies he is not forgotten, his name rings down the centuries, each echoes it on to his fellows. Think not to be forgotten through the ages. And the mother lay breathing steadily, but in the brain picture they pressed closer to her. Let me touch the child, said one, for I am love. If I touch him, he shall not walk through life alone. In the greatest dark, when he puts out his hand, he shall find another hand by it. When the world is against him, another shall say, You and I. And the child trembled. But another pressed close and said, Let me touch, for I am talent. I can do all things that have been done before. I touch the soldier, the statesman, the thinker, and the politician who succeed, and the writer who is never before his time and never behind it. If I touch the child, he shall not weep for failure. About the mother's head the bees were flying, touching her with their long, tapering limbs, and, in her brain picture, out of the shadow of the room came one with sallow face, deep-lined, the cheeks drawn into hollows, and a mouth smiling quiveringly. He stretched out his hand, and the mother drew back and cried, Who are you? He answered nothing, and she looked up between his eyelids, and she said, What can you give the child, health? And he said, The man I touch, there wakes up in his blood a burning fever that shall lick his blood as fire. The fever that I will give him shall be cured when his life is cured. You give wealth. He shook his head. The man whom I touch, when he bends to pick up gold, he sees suddenly a light over his head in the sky. While he looks up to see it, the gold slips from between his fingers, or sometimes another passing takes it from them. Fame? He answered. Likely not. For the man I touch, there is a path traced out in the sand by a finger which no man sees, that he must follow. Sometimes it leads almost to the top, and then turns down suddenly into the valley. He must follow it, though none else sees the tracing. Love? He said, He shall hunger for it, but he shall not find it. When he stretches out his arms to it, and would lay his heart against a thing he loves, then, far off along the horizon, he shall see a light play. He must go towards it. The thing he loves will not journey with him. He must travel alone. When he presses somewhat to his burning heart, crying, Mine, mine, my own, he shall hear a voice. Renounce, renounce, this is not thine. He shall succeed? He said, He shall fail. When he runs with others, they shall reach the goal before him. For strange voices shall call to him, 
and strange lights shall beckon him, and he must wait and listen. And this shall be the strangest, far off across the burning sands where, to other men, there is only the desert's waste, he shall see a blue sea. On that sea the sun shines always, and the water is blue as burning amethyst, and the foam is white on the shore. A great land rises from it, and he shall see upon the mountain tops burning gold. The mother said, He shall reach it, and he smiled curiously. She said, Is it real? And he said, What is real? And she looked up between his half-closed eyelids and said, Touch. And he leaned forward and laid his hand upon the sleeper and whispered to it, smiling. And this only she heard. This shall be thy reward, that the ideal shall be real to thee. And the child trembled, but the mother slept on heavily, and her brain picture vanished. But deep within her, the antenatal thing that lay here had a dream. In those eyes that had never seen the day, in that half-shaped brain was a sensation of light, light that it never had seen, light that perhaps it never should see, light that existed somewhere. And already it had its reward, the ideal was real to it. London End of A Dream of Wild Bees by Olive Schreiner A Remembered Dream by Henry Van Dyke This is the story of a dream that came to me some five and twenty years ago. It is as vivid in memory as anything that I have ever seen in the outward world, as distinct as any experience through which I have ever passed. Not all dreams are thus remembered. But some are. In the records of the mind, where the inner chronicle of life is written, they are intensely clear and veridical. I shall try to tell the story of this dream with an absolute faithfulness, adding nothing and leaving nothing out, but writing the narrative just as if the thing were real. Perhaps it was. Who can say? In the course of a journey, of the beginning and end of which I know nothing, I had come to a great city, whose name, if it was ever told me, I cannot recall. It was evidently a very ancient place. The dwelling houses and larger buildings were gray and beautiful with age, and the streets wound in and out among them wonderfully, like a maze. This city lay beside a river or estuary, though that was something that I did not find out until later, as you will see and the newer part of the town extended mainly on a wide, bare street running along a kind of low cliff, or embankment, where the basements of the small houses on the water side went down, below the level of the street, to the shore. But the older part of the town was closely and intricately built, with gabled roofs and heavy carved facades, hanging over the narrow stoned paved ways, which here and there led out suddenly into open squares. It was in what appeared to be the largest and most important of these squares that I was standing, a little before midnight. I had left my wife and our little girl in the lodging which we had found, and walked out alone to visit the sleeping town. The night sky was clear, save for a few filmy clouds which floated over the face of the full moon, obscuring it for an instant, but never completely hiding it, like veils in a shadow dance. The spire of the great cathedral was silver filigree on the moonlit side, and on the other side, black lace. The square was empty, but on the broad, shallow steps in front of the main entrance of the cathedral, two heroic figures were seated. At first I thought they were statues, 
Then I perceived they were alive and talking earnestly together. They were like Greek gods, very strong and beautiful and naked, but for some slight drapery that fell snow white around them. They glistened in the moonlight. I could not hear what they were saying, yet I could see that they were in a dispute which went to the very roots of life. They resembled each other strangely in form and feature, like twin brothers, but the face of one was noble, lofty, calm, full of a vast regret and compassion. The face of the other was proud, resentful, drawn with passion. He appeared to be accusing and renouncing his companion, breaking away from an ancient friendship in a swift, implacable hatred. But the companion seemed to plead with him and lean toward him and try to draw him closer. A strange fear and sorrow shook my heart. I felt that this mysterious contest was something of immense importance, a secret, ominous strife, a menace to the world. Then the two figures stood up, marvelously alike in strength and beauty, yet absolutely different in expression and bearing, the one serene and benignant, the other fierce and threatening. The quiet one was still pleading, with a hand laid upon the other's shoulder, but he shook it off and thrust his companion away with a proud, impatient gesture. At last I heard him speak. I have done with you, he cried. I do not believe in you. I have no more need of you. I renounce you. I will live without you. Away, forever out of my life. At this, a look of ineffable sorrow and pity came upon the great companion's face. You are free, he answered. I have only besought you, never constrained you. Since you will have it so, I must leave you now to yourself. He rose into the air, still looking downward with wise eyes full of grief and warning, until he vanished in silence beyond the thin clouds. The other did not look up, but lifting his head with a defiant laugh, shook his shoulders as if they were free of a burden. He strode swiftly around the corner of the cathedral and disappeared among the deep shadows. A sense of intolerable calamity fell upon me. I said to myself, that was man, and the other was God, and they have parted. Then the multitude of bells hidden in the lacework of the high tower began to sound. It was not the aerial fluttering music of the carillon, which I remembered hearing long ago from the belfries of the Low Countries. This was a confused and strident ringing, jangled and broken, full of sudden tumults and discords, as if the tower were shaken and the bells gave out their notes at hazard, in surprise and trepidation. It stopped as suddenly as it began. The great bell of the hour struck twelve. The windows of the cathedral glowed faintly with a light from within. It is New Year's Eve, I thought, although I knew perfectly well that the time was late summer. I had seen that, though the leaves on the trees of the square were no longer fresh, they had not yet fallen. I was certain that I must go into the cathedral. The western entrance was shut. I hurried to the south side. The dark, low door of the transept was open. I went in. The building was dimly lighted by huge candles which flickered and smoked like torches. I noticed that one of them, fastened against a pillar, was burning crooked, and the tallow ran down its side in thick white tears. The nave of the church was packed with a vast throng of people, all standing, closely crowded together, like the undergrowth in a forest. The rude screen was open or broken down, I could not tell which. The choir was bare like a clearing in the woods and filled with blazing light. On the high steps, with his back to the altar, stood man, his face gleaming with pride. I am the Lord, he cried. There is none above me, no law, no God. Man is power, man is the highest of all. A tremor of wonder and dismay, of excitement and division, shivered through the crowd. Some covered their faces, others stretched out their hands, others shook their fists in the air. A tumult of voices broke from the multitude, voices of exultation and anger and horror and strife. The floor of the cathedral was moved and lifted by a mysterious groundswell. The pillars trembled and wavered, the candles flared and went out. The crowd, stricken dumb with a panic fear, rushed to the doors, burst open the main entrance, and struggling in furious silence poured out of the building. I was swept along with them, striving to keep on my feet. One thought possessed me. I must get to my wife and child, save them, bring them out of this accursed city. 
As I hurried across the square, I looked up at the cathedral spire. It was swaying and rocking in the air like the mast of a ship at sea. The lacework fell from it in blocks of stone. The people rushed screaming through the rain of death. Many were struck down and lay where they fell. I ran as fast as I could, but it was impossible to run far. Every street and alley vomited men, all struggling together, fighting, shouting, or shrieking, striking one another down, trampling over the fallen. A hideous melee. There was an incessant rattling noise in the air, and heavier peals as of thunder shook the houses. Here a wide rent yawned in a wall, there a roof caved in. The windows fell into the street in showers of broken glass. How I got through this inferno, I do not know. Buffeted and blinded, stumbling and scrambling to my feet again, turning this way or that way to avoid the thickest centers of the strife, oppressed and paralyzed by a feeling of impotence that put an iron band around my heart, driven always by the intense longing to reach my wife and child, somehow I had a sense of struggling on. Then I came into a quieter quarter of the town and ran until I reached the lodging where I had left them. They were waiting just inside the door, anxious and trembling, but I was amazed to find them so little panic-stricken. The little girl had her doll in her arms. "'What is it?' asked my wife. "'What must we do?' "'Come,' I cried. "'Something frightful has happened here. I can't explain now. We must get away at once. Come, quickly.' Then I took a hand of each, and we hastened through the streets, vaguely staring away from the center of the city." Presently we came into that wide new street of mean houses, of which I have already spoken. There were a few people in it, but they moved heavily and feebly, as if some mortal illness lay upon them. Their faces were pale and haggard with a helpless anxiety to escape more quickly. The houses seemed half deserted. The shades were drawn, the doors closed. But since it was all so quiet, I thought we might find some temporary shelter there, so I knocked at the door of a house where there was a dim light behind the drawn shade in one of the windows. After a while, the door was opened by a woman who held the end of her shawl across her mouth. All that I could see was the black sorrow of her eyes. "'Go away,' she said slowly. "'The plague is here. My children are dying of it. You must not come in. Go away!' So we hurried on through the plague-smitten street, burdened with a new fear. Soon we saw a house on the riverside, which looked absolutely empty. The shades were up, the windows open, the doors stood ajar. I hesitated, plucked up my courage, resolved that we must get to the waterside in some way in order to escape from the net of death which encircled us. Come, I said, let us try to go down through this house, but cover your mouths. We groped through the empty passageway and down the basement stair. The thick cobwebs swept my face. I noted them with joy, for I thought they proved that the house had been deserted for some time, and so perhaps it might not be infected. We descended into a room which seemed to have been the kitchen. There was a stove dimly visible at one side and an old broken kettle on the floor over which we stumbled. The back door was locked, but it swung outward as I broke it open. We stood upon a narrow, dingy beach, where the small waves were lapping. By this time, the little day had begun to whiten the eastern sky. A pallid light was diffused. I could see westward down to the main harbor, beside the heart of the city. The sails and smokestacks of the great ships were visible, all passing out to sea. I wished that we were there. Here in front of us the water seemed shallower. It was probably only a tributary or backwater of the main stream, but it was sprinkled with smaller vessels, sloops and yawls and luggers, all filled with people and slowly creeping seaward. There was one little boat quite near to us, which seemed to be waiting for someone. There were some people on it, but it was not crowded. Come, I said, this is for us, we must wade out to it. So I took my wife by the hand and the child in the other arm, and we went into the water. Soon it came up to our knees, to our waists. Hurry, shouted the old man at the tiller. No time to spare. Just a minute more, I answered. Only one minute. That minute seemed like a year. The sail of the boat was shaking in the wind. When it filled, she must move away. We waited on, and at last I grasped the gunwale of the boat. I lifted the child in and helped my wife to climb over the side. They clung to me. The little vessel began to move gently away. 
Get in, cried the old man sharply. Get in quick. But I felt that I could not. I dared not. I let go of the boat. I cried goodbye and turned to wait ashore. I was compelled to go back to the doomed city. I must know what would come of the parting of man from God. The tide was running out more swiftly. The water swirled around my knees. I awoke. But the dream remained with me, just as I have told it to you. End of A Remembered Dream by Henry Van Dyke The Dream of a Ridiculous Man by Fyodor Dostoevsky Part 1 I am a ridiculous person. Now they call me a madman. That would be a promotion if it were not that I remain as ridiculous in their eyes as before. But now I do not resent it. They are all dear to me now, even when they laugh at me. And indeed, it is just then that they are particularly dear to me. I could join in their laughter, not exactly at myself, but through affection for them, if I did not feel so sad as I look at them. Sad because they do not know the truth, and I do know it. Oh, how hard it is to be the only one who knows the truth. But they won't understand that. No, they won't understand it. In old days, I used to be miserable at seeming ridiculous. Not seeming, uh, but being. I have always been ridiculous, and I have known it, perhaps from the hour I was born. Perhaps from the time I was seven years old, I knew I was ridiculous. Afterwards, I went to school, studied at the university, and do you know? The more I learned, the more thoroughly I understood that I was ridiculous. So that it seemed in the end as though all the sciences I studied at the university existed only to prove and make evident to me as I went more deeply into them that I was ridiculous. It was the same with life as it was with science. With every year, the same consciousness of the ridiculous figure I cut in every relation grew and strengthened. Everyone always laughed at me, but not one of them knew or guessed that if there were one man on earth who knew better than anybody else that I was absurd, it was myself. And what I resented most of all was that they did not know that. But that was my own fault. I was so proud that nothing would have ever induced me to talk to anyone. The pride grew in me with the years, and if it had happened that I allowed myself to confess to anyone that I was ridiculous, I believe that I should have blown out my brains the same evening. Oh, how I suffered in my early youth from the fear that I might give way and confess it to my schoolfellows. But since I grew to manhood, I have for some unknown reason become calmer, though I realize my awful characteristic more fully every year. I say unknown, for to this day I cannot tell why it was. Perhaps it was owing to the terrible misery that was growing in my soul through something which was of more consequence than anything else about me. That something was the conviction that had come upon me that nothing in the world mattered. I had long had an inkling of it, but the full realization came last year almost suddenly. I suddenly felt that it was all the same to me whether the world existed or whether there had never been anything at all. I began to feel with all my being that there was nothing existing. At first I fancied that many things had existed in the past, but afterwards I guessed that there never had been anything in the past either, but that it had only seemed so for some reason. Little by little, I guessed that there would be nothing in the future either. Then I left off being angry with people and almost ceased to notice them. Indeed, this showed itself even in the pettiest trifles. I used, for instance, to knock against people in the street, and not so much from being lost in thought, what had I to think about? I had almost given up thinking by that time. Nothing mattered to me. 
if at least I had solved my problems. Oh, I had not settled one of them, and how many of them they were. But I gave up caring about anything, and all the problems disappeared. And it was after that that I found out the truth. I learned the truth last November, on the 3rd of November to be precise, and I remember every instant since. It was a gloomy evening, one of the gloomiest possible evenings. I was going home at about 11 o'clock, and I remember that I thought that the evening could not be gloomier, even physically. Rain had been falling all day, and it had been a cold, gloomy, almost menacing rain, with, I remember, an unmistakable spite against mankind. Suddenly, between 10 and 11, it had stopped, and it was followed by a horrible dampness, colder and damper than the rain, and a sort of steam was rising from everything, from every stone in the street, from every by-lane, if one looked down it as far as one could. A thought suddenly occurred to me that if all the street lamps had been put out, it would have been less cheerless, that the gas made one's heart sadder because it lighted it all up. I had had scarcely any dinner that day, and had been spending the evening with an engineer, and two other friends had been there also. I sat silent. I fancy I bored them. They talked of something rousing, and suddenly they got excited over it. But they did not really care. I could see that, and only made a show of being excited. I suddenly said as much to them. My friends, I said, you really do not care one way or the other. They were not offended, but they all laughed at me. That was because I spoke without any note of reproach, simply because it did not matter to me. They saw it did not, and it amused them. As I was thinking about the gas lamps in the street, I looked up at the sky. The sky was horribly dark, but one could distinctly see tattered clouds, and between them fathomless black patches. Suddenly, I noticed in one of these patches a star, and began watching it intently. That was because that star gave me an idea. I decided to kill myself that night. I had firmly determined to do so two months before, and, poor as I was, I bought a splendid revolver that very day and loaded it. But two months had passed and it was still lying in my drawer. I was so utterly indifferent that I wanted to seize a moment when I could not be so indifferent. Why, I don't know. And so, for two months, every night that I came home, I thought I would shoot myself. I kept waiting for the right moment. And so now, this star gave me a thought. I made up my mind that it should certainly be that night. And why the star gave me the thought, I don't know. And just as I was looking at the sky, this little girl took me by the elbow. The street was empty and there was scarcely anyone to be seen. A cabman was sleeping in the distance in his cab. It was a child of eight with a kerchief on her head, wearing nothing but a wretched little dress all soaked with rain. But I noticed particularly her wet, broken shoes, and I recall them now. They caught my eye particularly. She suddenly pulled me by the elbow and called me. She was not weeping, but was spasmodically crying out some words which she could not utter properly because she was shivering and shuddering all over. She was in terror about something and kept crying, Mammy, Mammy. I turned facing her, I did not say a word, and went on. But she ran, pulling at me, and there was a note in her voice which in frightened the children means despair. I know that sound. Though she did not articulate the words, I understood that her mother was dying, or that something of the sort was happening to them, and that she had run out to call someone, to find something to help her mother. I did not go with her. On the contrary, I had an impulse to drive her away. I told her first to go to a policeman, but clasping her hands, she ran beside me, sobbing and 
gasping and would not leave me. Then I stamped my foot and shouted at her. She called out, Sir, Sir, but suddenly abandoned me and rushed headlong across the road. Some other passerby appeared there, and she evidently flew from me to him. I mounted up to my fifth story. I have a room in a flat where there are other lodgers. My room is small and poor, with a garret window in the shape of a semicircle. I have a sofa covered with American leather, a table with books on it, two chairs, and a comfortable armchair as old as old can be, but of the good old-fashioned shape. I sat down, lighted the candle, and began thinking. In the room next to mine, through the partition wall, a perfect bedlam was going on, as it had been going on for the last three days. A retired captain lived there, and he had half a dozen visitors, gentlemen of doubtful reputation, drinking vodka and playing stoss with old cards. The night before, there had been a fight, and I know that two of them had been for a long time engaged in dragging each other about by the hair. The landlady wanted to complain, but she was in abject terror of the captain. There was only one other lodger in the flat, a thin little regimental lady on a visit to Petersburg, with three little children who had been taken ill since they had come into the lodgings. Both she and her children were in mortal fear of the captain, and lay trembling and crossing themselves all night. And the youngest child had a sort of fit from fright. That captain, I know for a fact, sometimes stops people in the Nevsky Prospect and begs. They won't take him into the service, but strange to say, that's why I'm telling this. All this month that the captain has been here, his behavior has caused me no annoyance. I have, of course, tried to avoid his acquaintance from the very beginning, and he too was bored with me from the first. But I never care how much they shout the other side of the partition, nor how many of them there are in there. I sit up all night and forget them so completely that I do not even hear them. I stay awake till daybreak, and have been going on like that for the last year. I sit up all night in my armchair at the table, doing nothing. I only read by day. I sit, don't even think. Ideas of a sort wander through my mind, and I let them come and go as they will. A whole candle is burnt every night. I sat down very quietly at the table, took out the revolver, and put it down before me. When I had put it down, I asked myself, I remember, is that so? And answered with complete conviction, it is. That is, I shall shoot myself. I knew that I should shoot myself that night for certain, but how much longer I should go on sitting at the table, I did not know. And no doubt I should have shot myself if it had not been for that little girl. Section 2 you see, though nothing mattered to me, I could feel pain, for instance. If anyone had struck me, it would have hurt me. It was the same morally. If anything very pathetic happened, I should have felt pity, just as I used to in old days when there were things in my life that did matter to me. I had felt pity that evening. I should have certainly helped the child. Why then had I not helped the little girl? because of an idea that occurred to me at that time. When she was calling and pulling at me, a question suddenly arose before me, and I could not settle it. The question was an idle one, but I was vexed. I was vexed at the reflection that if I were going to make an end of myself that night, nothing in life ought to have mattered to me. Why was it that all at once I did not feel that nothing mattered, and was sorry for the little girl. I remember that I was very sorry for her, so much so that I felt a strange pang, quite incongruous in my position. Really, I do not know better how to convey my fleeting sensation at the moment, but the sensation persisted at home when I was sitting at the table, and I was very much irritated as I had not been for a long time past. 
one reflection followed another. I saw clearly that so long as I was still a human being and not nothingness, I was alive, and so could suffer, be angry, and feel shame at my actions. So be it. But if I am going to kill myself in two hours, say, what is a little girl to me, and what have I to do with shame or with anything else in the world? I shall turn into nothing, absolutely nothing. And can it really be true that the consciousness that I shall completely cease to exist immediately, and so everything else will cease to exist, does not in the least affect my feeling of pity for the child, nor the feeling of shame after a contemptible action? I stamped and shouted at the unhappy child, as though to say, Not only I feel no pity, but even if I behave inhumanly and contemptibly, I am free to, for in another two hours everything will be extinguished. Do you believe that that was why I shouted that? I am almost convinced of it now. It seemed clear to me that life and the world somehow depended upon me now. I may almost say that the world now seemed created for me alone. If I shut myself, the world would cease to be, at least for me. I say nothing of its being likely that nothing will exist for anyone when I am gone, and that as soon as my consciousness is extinguished, the whole world will vanish too and become void like a phantom, as a mere appurtenance of my consciousness, for possibly all this world and all these people are only me myself. I remember that as I sat and reflected, I turned all these new questions that swarmed one after another quite the other way, and thought of something quite new. For instance, a strange reflection suddenly occurred to me that if I had lived before on the moon or on Mars, and there had committed the most disgraceful and dishonorable action, and had there been put to such shame and ignominy as one can only conceive and realize in dreams, in nightmares, and if finding myself afterwards on earth I were able to retain the memory of what I had done on the other planet, and at the same time knew that I should never, under any circumstances, return there, then looking from the earth to the moon, should I care or not? Should I feel shame for that action or not? These were idle and superfluous questions, for the revolver was already lying there before me, and I knew in every fiber of my being that it would happen, for certain, but they excited me, and I raged. I could not die now without having first settled something. In short, the child had saved me, for I put off my pistol shot for the sake of these questions. Meanwhile, the clamor had begun to subside in the captain's room, they had finished their game, were settling down to sleep, and meanwhile were grumbling and languidly winding up their quarrels. At that point, I suddenly fell asleep in my chair at the table, a thing which had never happened to me before. I dropped asleep quite unawares. Dreams, as we all know, are very queer things. Some parts are presented with appalling vividness, with details worked up with the elaborate finish of jewelry, while others one gallops through, as it were, without noticing them at all, as, for instance, through space and time. Dreams seem to be spurred on not by reason but desire, not by the head but by the heart, and yet what complicated tricks my reason has played sometimes in dreams, what utterly incomprehensible things happened to it. My brother died five years ago, for instance. I sometimes dream of him. He takes part in my affairs. We are very much interested, and yet all through my dream, I quite know and remember that my brother is dead and buried. How is it that I am not surprised that although he is dead, he is here beside me and working with me? Why is it that my reason fully accepts it? But enough. I will begin about my dream. Yes, I dreamt a dream, my dream of the 3rd of November. They tease me now, telling me it was only a dream. But does it matter whether it was a dream or reality, if the dream made known to me the truth? 
If once one has recognized the truth and seen it, you know that it is the truth and that there is no other, and there cannot be whether you are asleep or awake. Let it be a dream. So be it. But that real life of which you make so much, I had meant to extinguish by suicide. And my dream, my dream, oh, it revealed to me a different life, renewed, grand, and full of power. Listen, part three. I have mentioned that I dropped asleep unawares and even seemed to be still reflecting upon the same subjects. I suddenly dreamt that I picked up the revolver and aimed it straight at my heart, my heart and not my head, and I had determined beforehand to fire at my head, at my right temple. After aiming at my chest, I waited a second or two and suddenly my candle, my table, and the wall in front of me began moving and heaving. I made haste to pull the trigger. In dreams, you sometimes fall from a height or are stabbed or beaten, but you never feel pain unless, perhaps, you really bruise yourself against the bedstead. Then you feel pain and almost always wake up from it. It was the same in my dream. I did not feel any pain. But it seemed as though with my shot everything within me was shaken, and everything was suddenly dimmed, and it grew horribly black around me. I seemed to be blinded and benumbed, and I was lying on something hard, stretched upon my back. I saw nothing, and could not make the slightest movement. People were walking and shouting around me. The captain bawled, the landlady shrieked, and suddenly another break, and I was being carried in a closed coffin, and I felt how the coffin was shaking and reflected upon it, and for the first time the idea struck me that I was dead, utterly dead. I knew it and had no doubt of it. I could neither see nor move, and yet I was feeling and reflecting. But I was soon reconciled to the position, as one usually does in a dream, accepting the facts without disputing them. And now I was buried in the earth. They all went away. I was left alone, utterly alone. I did not move. Whenever before I had imagined being buried, the one sensation I associated with the grave was that of damp and cold. So now I felt that I was very cold, especially the tips of my toes but I felt nothing else. I lay still. Strange to say, I expected nothing, accepting without dispute that a dead man had nothing to expect. But it was damp. I don't know how long a time passed, whether an hour or several days or many days, but all at once a drop of water fell on my closed left eye, making its way through a coffin lid. It was followed a minute later by a second, and then a minute later by a third, and so on, regularly every minute. There was a sudden glow of profound indignation in my heart, and I suddenly felt in it a pang of physical pain. That's my wound, I thought. That's a bullet. And drop after drop, every minute, kept falling on my closed eyelid. And all at once, not with my voice, but with my whole being, I called upon the power that was responsible for all that was happening to me. Whoever you may be, if you exist, and if anything more rational than what is happening here is possible, suffer it to be here now. But if you are revenging yourself upon me for my senseless suicide by the hideousness and absurdity of this subsequent existence, then let me tell you that no torture could ever equal the contempt which I shall go on dumbly feeling, though my martyrdom may last a million years. I made this appeal and held my peace. There was a full minute of unbroken silence, and again another drop fell. But I knew with infinite, unshakable certainty that everything would change immediately. And behold, my grave suddenly was rent asunder. 
That is, I don't know whether it was opened or dug up, but I was caught up by some dark, unknown being, and we found ourselves in space. I suddenly regained my sight. It was the dead of night, and never, never had there been such darkness. We were flying through space far away from the earth. I did not question the being who was taking me. I was proud and waited. I assured myself that I was not afraid and was thrilled with ecstasy at the thought that I was not afraid. I do not know how long we were flying. I cannot imagine. It happened as it always does in dreams when you skip over space and time and the laws of thought and existence and only pause upon the points for which the heart yearns. I remember that I suddenly saw in the darkness a star. Is that serious? I asked impulsively, though I had not meant to ask any questions. No, that is the star you saw between the clouds when you were coming home, the being who was carrying me replied. I knew that it had something like a human face. Strange to say, I did not like that being. In fact, I felt an intense aversion for it. I had expected complete non-existence, and that was why I put a bullet through my heart. And here I was, in the hands of a creature, not human, of course, but yet living, existing. And so there is life beyond the grave, I thought, with a strange frivolity one has in dreams. But in its inmost depth, my heart remained unchanged. And if I have got to exist again, I thought, and live once more under the control of some irresistible power, I won't be vanquished and humiliated. You know that I am afraid of you and despise me for that, I said suddenly to my companion, unable to refrain from the humiliating question which implied a confession, and feeling my humiliation stab my heart as with a pen. He did not answer my question, but all at once I felt that he was not even despising me, but was laughing at me and had no compassion for me, and that our journey had an unknown and mysterious object that concerned me only. Fear was growing in my heart. Something was mutely and painfully communicated to me from my silent companion and permeated my whole being. We were flying through dark, unknown space. I had for some time lost sight of the constellations familiar to my eyes. I knew that there were stars in the heavenly spaces, the light of which took thousands or millions of years to reach the earth. Perhaps we were already flying through those spaces. I expected something with a terrible anguish that tortured my heart. And suddenly I was thrilled by a familiar feeling that stirred me to the depths. I suddenly caught sight of our sun. I knew that it could not be our sun that gave life to our earth, and that we were an infinite distance from our sun. But for some reason... I knew in my whole being that it was a sun exactly like ours, a duplicate of it. A sweet, thrilling feeling resounded with ecstasy in my heart. The kindred power of the same light which had given me light stirred an echo in my heart and awakened it, and I had a sensation of life, the old life of the past for the first time since I had been in the grave. But if that is the sun, if that is exactly the same as our sun, I cried, where is the earth? And my companion pointed to a star twinkling in the distance with an emerald light. We were flying straight toward it. And are such repetitions possible in the universe? Can that be the law of nature? And if that is an earth there, can it be just the same earth as ours, just the same? as poor, as unhappy, but precious and beloved forever, arousing in the most ungrateful of her children the same poignant love for her that we feel for our earth, I cried out, shaken by irresistible, ecstatic love for the old familiar earth which I had left. The image of the poor child whom I had repulsed flashed through my mind. You shall see it all, answered my companion, and there was a note of sorrow in his voice. 
but we were rapidly approaching the planet. It was growing before my eyes. I could already distinguish the ocean, the outline of Europe, and suddenly a feeling of great and holy jealousy glowed in my heart. How can it be repeated and what for? I love and can only love the earth which I have left, stained with my blood, when, in my ingratitude, I quenched my life with a bullet in my heart, but I have never, never ceased to love that earth, and perhaps on the very night I parted from it, I loved it more than ever. Is there suffering upon this new earth? On our earth we can only love with suffering and through suffering. We cannot love otherwise, and we know of no other sort of love. I want suffering in order to love. I long, I thirst, this very instant to kiss with tears the earth that I have left, and I don't want, I won't accept life on any other. But my companion had already left me. I suddenly, quite without noticing how, found myself on this other earth in the bright light of a sunny day, fair as paradise. I believe I was standing on one of the islands that make up on our globe the Greek archipelago, or on the coast of the mainland facing that archipelago. Oh, everything was exactly as it is with us, only everything seemed to have a festive radiance, the splendor of some great holy triumph attained at last. The caressing sea, green as emerald, splashed softly upon the shore and kissed it with manifest, almost conscious love. The tall, lovely trees stood in all the glory of their blossom, and their innumerable leaves greeted me, I am certain, with their soft, caressing rustle and seemed to articulate words of love. The grass glowed with bright and fragrant flowers, birds were flying in flocks in the air and perched fearlessly on my shoulders and arms and joyfully struck me with their darling fluttering wings. And at last I saw and knew the people of this happy land. They came to me of themselves, they surrounded me, kissed me, the children of the sun, the children of their sun. Oh, how beautiful they were! Never had I seen on our own earth such beauty in mankind. Only perhaps in our children, in their earlier years, one might find some remote, faint reflection of this beauty. The eyes of these happy people shone with a clear brightness. Their faces were radiant with the light of reason and fullness of a serenity that comes of perfect understanding. But those faces were gay. In their words and voices there was a note of childlike joy. Oh, from the first moment, from the first glance at them, I understood it all. It was the earth untarnished by the fall. On it lived people who had not sinned. They lived just in such a paradise as that in which, according to all the legends of mankind, our first parents lived before they sinned. The only difference was that all this earth was the same paradise. These people, laughing joyfully, thronged round me and caressed me. They took me home with them and each of them tried to reassure me. Oh, they asked me no questions, but they seemed, I fancied, to know everything without asking, and they wanted to make haste and smooth away the signs of suffering from my face. Section 4 And do you know what? Well, granted that it was only a dream, yet the sensation of the love of those innocent and beautiful people has remained with me forever and I feel as though their love is still flowing out to me from over there. I have seen them myself, have known them, and been convinced. I love them. I suffered for them afterwards. Oh, I understood at once, even at the time, that in many things I could not understand them at all. As an up-to-date Russian progressive and contemptible Petersburger, it struck me as inexplicable that, knowing so much, 
They had, for instance, no science like ours. But I soon realized that their knowledge was gained and fostered by intuitions different from those of us on earth, and that their aspirations, too, were quite different. They desired nothing and were at peace. They did not aspire to knowledge of life as we aspire to understand it, because their lives were full. But their knowledge was higher and deeper than ours. For our science seeks to explain what life is, aspires to understand it, in order to teach others how to live, while they, without science, knew how to live. And that I understood, but I could not understand their knowledge. They showed me their trees, and I could not understand the intense love with which they looked at them. It was as though they were talking with creatures like themselves. And perhaps I shall not be mistaken if I say that they conversed with them. Yes, they had found their language, and I am convinced that the trees understood them. They looked at all nature like that, at the animals who lived in peace with them and did not attack them, but loved them, conquered by their love. They pointed to the stars and told me something about them which I could not understand, but I am convinced that they were somehow in touch with the stars, not only in thought, but by some living channel. Oh, these people did not persist in trying to make me understand them. They loved me without that, but I knew that they would never understand me. And so I hardly spoke to them about our earth. I only kissed in their presence the earth on which they lived and mutely worshipped them themselves. And they saw that and let me worship them without being abashed at my adoration, for they themselves loved much. They were not unhappy on my account when at times I kissed their feet with tears, joyfully conscious of the love with which they would respond to mine. At times I asked myself with wonder, how it was that they were able never to offend a creature like me, and never once to arouse a feeling of jealousy or envy in me. Often I wondered how it could be that, boastful and untruthful as I was, I never talked to them of what I knew, of which, of course, they had no notion, that I was never tempted to do so by a desire to astonish or even to benefit them. They were as gay and sportive as children. They wandered about their lovely woods and copses. They sang their lovely songs. Their fare was light, the fruits of their trees, the honey from their woods, and the milk of the animals who loved them. The work they did for food and raiment was brief and not laborious. They loved and begot children, but I never noticed in them the impulse of that cruel sensuality which overcomes almost every man on this earth, all and each, and is the source of almost every sin of mankind on earth. They rejoiced at the arrival of children as new beings to share their happiness. There is no quarreling, no jealousy among them, and they did not even know what the words meant. Their children were the children of all, for they all made up one family. There was scarcely any illness among them, though there was death. But their old people died peacefully, as though falling asleep, giving blessings and smile to those who surrounded them to take their last farewell with bright and loving smiles. I never saw grief or tears on those occasions, but only love which reached the point of ecstasy, but a calm ecstasy made perfect and contemplative. One might think that they were still in contact with the departed after death, and that their earthly union was not cut short by death. They scarcely understood me when I questioned them about immortality, but evidently they were so convinced of it without reasoning that it was not for them a question at all. They had no temples, but they had a real living and uninterrupted sense of oneness with the whole of the universe. They had no creed, but they had a certain knowledge 
that when their earthly joy had reached the limits of earthly nature, then there would come for them, for the living and for the dead, a still greater fullness of contact with the whole of the universe. They looked forward to that moment with joy, but without haste, not pining for it, but seeming to have a foretaste of it in their hearts, of which they talked to one another. In the evening, before going to sleep, they liked singing in musical and harmonious chorus. In these songs they expressed all the sensation that the parting day had given them, sang its glories, and took leave of it. They sang the praises of nature, of the sea, of the woods. They liked making songs about one another, and praised each other like children. They were the simplest songs, but they sprang from their hearts and went to one's heart. And not only in their songs, but in all their lives, they seemed to do nothing but admire one another. It was like being in love with each other, but an all-embracing, universal feeling. Some of their songs, solemn and rapturous, I scarcely understood at all. Though I understood the words, I could never fathom their full significance. It remained, as it were, beyond the grasp of my mind, yet my heart unconsciously absorbed it more and more. I often told them that I had had a presentiment of it long before, that this joy and glory had come to me on our earth in the form of a yearning melancholy that at times approached insufferable sorrow, that I had had a foreknowledge of them all and of their glory in the dreams of my heart and visions of my mind, that often on our earth I could not look at the setting sun without tears, that in my hatred for the men of our earth there was always a yearning anguish. Why could I not hate them without loving them? Why could I not help forgiving them? And in my love for them there was a yearning grief. Why could I not love them without hating them? They listened to me, and I saw they could not conceive what I was saying, but I did not regret that I had spoken to them of it. I knew that they understood the intensity of my yearning anguish over those whom I had left, but when they looked at me with their sweet eyes full of love, when I felt that in their presence my heart too became as innocent and just as theirs, the feeling of the fullness of life took my breath away, and I worshipped them in silence. Oh, everyone laughs in my face now, and assures me that one cannot dream of such details as I am telling now, that I only dreamed or felt one sensation that arose in my heart in delirium, and made up the details myself when I woke up. And when I told them that perhaps it really was so, my God, how they shouted with laughter in my face, and what mirth I caused. Oh, yes, of course I was overcome by the mere sensation of my dream, and that was all that was preserved in my cruelly wounded heart. But the actual forms and images of my dream, that is, the very ones I really saw at the very time of my dream, were filled with such harmony, were so lovely and enchanting, and were so actual, that on awakening I was, of course, incapable of clothing them in our poor language, so that they were bound to become blurred in my mind. And so, perhaps, I really was forced afterward to make up the details, and so, of course, to distort them in my passionate desire to convey some, at least, of them as quickly as I could. But on the other hand, how can I help believing that it was all true? It was perhaps a thousand times brighter, happier, and more joyful than I describe it. Granted that I dreamed it, yet it must have been real. You know, I will tell you a secret. Perhaps it was not a dream at all. For then something happened so awful, something so horribly true, that it could not have been imagined in a dream. My heart may have originated the dream, but would my heart alone have been capable of originating the awful event which happened to me afterward? How could I alone have invented it or imagined it in my dream? 
Could my petty heart and my fickle, trivial mind have risen to such a revelation of truth? Oh, judge for yourselves. Hitherto I have concealed it, but now I will tell the truth. The fact is that I corrupted them all. Section 5 Yes, yes, it ended in my corrupting them all. How could it come to pass? I do not know, but I remember it clearly. The dream embraced thousands of years and left in me only a sense of the whole. I only know that I was the cause of their sin and downfall. Like a vile trichina, like a germ of the plague infecting whole kingdoms, so I contaminated all this earth, so happy and sinless, before my coming. They learnt to lie, grew fond of lying, and discovered the charm of falsehood. Oh, at first perhaps it began innocently, with a jest, coquetry, with amorous play, perhaps indeed with a germ, but that germ of falsity made its way into their hearts and pleased them. Then sensuality was soon begotten. Sensuality begot jealousy, jealousy, cruelty. Oh, I don't know, I don't remember, but soon, very soon, the first blood was shed. They marveled and were horrified and began to be split up and divided. They formed into unions, but it was against one another. Reproaches, upbraidings followed. They came to no shame, and shame brought them to virtue. The conception of honor sprang up and every union began waving its flags. They began torturing animals, and the animals withdrew from them into the forests and became hostile to them. They began to struggle for separation, for isolation, for individuality, for mine and thine. They began to talk in different languages. They became acquainted with sorrow and loved sorrow. They thirsted for suffering and said that truth could only be attained through suffering. Then science appeared. As they became wicked, they began talking of brotherhood and humanitarianism and understood those ideas. As they became criminal, they invented justice and drew up whole legal codes in order to observe it and to ensure their being kept, set up a guillotine. They hardly remembered what they had lost in fact, refused to believe that they had ever been happy and innocent. They even laughed at the possibility of this happiness in the past and called it a dream. They could not even imagine it in definite form and shape, but strange and wonderful to relate, though they lost all faith in their past happiness and called it a legend. They so longed to be happy and innocent once more that they succumbed to this desire like children made an idol of it, set up temples, and worshipped their own idea, their own desire, though at the same time they fully believed that it was unattainable and could not be realized. Yet they bowed down to it and adored it with tears. Nevertheless, if it could have happened, they had returned to the innocent and happy condition which they had lost, and if someone had shown it to them again, and had asked them whether they wanted to go back to it, they would certainly have refused. They answered me, We may be deceitful, wicked, and unjust. We know it, and weep over it. We grieve over it. We torment and punish ourselves, more perhaps than that merciful judge who will judge us, and whose name we know not. But we have science, and by means of it we shall find the truth, and we shall arrive at it consciously. Knowledge is higher than feeling. The consciousness of life is higher than life. Science will give us wisdom. Wisdom will reveal the laws, and the knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness. That is what they said. And after saying such things, everyone began to love himself better than anyone else, and indeed they could not do otherwise. All became so jealous of the rights of their own personality that they did their very utmost to curtail 
and destroy them in others, and made that the chief thing in their lives. Slavery followed, even voluntary slavery. The weak eagerly submitted to the strong, on condition that the latter aided them to subdue the still weaker. Then there were saints, who came to these people weeping, and talked to them of their pride, of their loss of harmony, and due proportion of their loss of shame. They were laughed at or pelted with stones. Holy blood was shed on the threshold of the temples. Then there arose men who began to think how to bring all the people together again, so that everybody, while still loving himself best of all, might not interfere with others, and all might live together in something like a harmonious society. Regular wars sprang up over this idea. All the combatants at the same time firmly believed that science, wisdom, and the instinct of self-preservation would force men at last to unite into a harmonious and rational society. And so, meanwhile, to hasten matters, the wise endeavored to exterminate as rapidly as possible all who were not wise, and did not understand their idea that the latter might not hinder its triumph. But the instinct of self-preservation grew rapidly weaker. There arose men, haughty and sensual, who demanded all or nothing. In order to obtain everything, they resorted to crime, and if they did not succeed, to suicide. There arose religions with a cult of non-existence and self-destruction for the sake of the everlasting peace of annihilation. At last these people grew weary of their meaningless toil, and signs of suffering came into their faces, and then they proclaimed that suffering was beauty, for in suffering alone was their meaning. They glorified suffering in their songs. I moved about among them, wringing my hands and weeping over them, but I love them perhaps more than in the old days when there was no suffering in their faces and when they were innocent and so lovely. I love the earth they had polluted even more than when it had been a paradise, if only because sorrow had come to it. Alas, I always loved sorrow and tribulation, but only for myself, for myself. But I wept over them, pitying them. I stretched out my hands to them in despair, blaming, cursing, and despising myself. I told them that all this was my doing, mine alone, that it was I had brought them to corruption, contamination, and falsity. I besought them to crucify me. I taught them how to make a cross. I could not go myself. I had not the strength, but I wanted to suffer at their hands. I yearned for suffering. I longed that my blood should be drained to the last drop in these agonies. But they only laughed at me, and began at last to look upon me as crazy. They justified me. They declared that they had only got what they wanted themselves, and that all that now was could not have been otherwise. At last they declared to me that I was becoming dangerous, and that they should lock me up in a madhouse if I could not hold my tongue. Then such grief took possession of my soul that my heart was wrung, and I felt as though I were dying, and then, then I awoke. It was morning. That is, it was not yet daylight, but about six o'clock. I woke up in the same armchair. My candle had burnt out. Everyone was asleep in the captain's room, and there was a stillness all round, rare in our flat. First of all, I leapt up in great amazement. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before, not even the most vivid, trivial detail. I had never, for instance, fallen asleep like this in my armchair. While I was standing and coming to myself, I suddenly caught sight of my revolver, lying loaded and ready, but instantly I thrust it away. Oh, now, life, life, I lifted up my hands and called upon eternal truth, not with words, but with tears. 
Ecstasy, immeasurable ecstasy, flooded my soul. Yes, life and spreading the good tidings. Oh, I look at that moment resolved to spread the good tidings, and resolved it, of course, for my whole life. I go to spread the tidings. I want to spread the tidings. Of what? Of the truth. For I have seen it, I have seen it with my own eyes, I have seen it in all its glory. And since then, I have been preaching. Moreover, I love all those who laugh at me more than any of the rest. Why that is so, I do not know, and cannot explain. But so be it. I am told that I am vague and confused, that if I am vague and confused now, what shall I be later on? It is true indeed. I am vague and confused, and perhaps as time goes on, I shall be more so. And of course I shall make many blunders before I find out how to preach, that is, find out what words to say and what things to do, for it is a very difficult task. I see all that as clear as daylight. But listen, who does not make mistakes? And yet, you know, all are making for the same goal. All are striving in the same direction anyway, from the sage to the lowest robber, only by different roads. It is an old truth, but this is what is new. I cannot go far wrong, for I have seen the truth. I have seen and I know that people can be beautiful and happy without losing the power of living on earth. I will not and cannot believe that evil is the normal condition of mankind, and it is just this faith of mine that they laugh at. But how can I help believing it? I have seen the truth. It is not as though I had invented it with my mind. I have seen it, seen it, and the living image of it has filled my soul forever. I have seen it in such full perfection that I cannot believe that it is impossible for people to have it. And so, how can I go wrong? I shall make some slips, no doubt, and shall perhaps talk in second-hand language, but not for long. The living image of what I saw will always be with me, and it will always correct and guide me. Oh, I am full of courage and freshness, and I will go on and on, if it were, for a thousand years. Do you know? At first I meant to conceal the fact that I corrupted them. But that was a mistake. That was my first mistake. But truth whispered to me that I was lying, and preserved me and corrected me. But how establish paradise? I don't know, because I do not know how to put it into words. After my dream, I lost command of words, all the chief words anyway, the most necessary ones. But never mind, I shall go and I shall keep talking, I won't leave off, for anyway I have seen it with my own eyes, though I cannot describe what I saw. But the scoffers do not understand that. It was a dream, they say, delirium, hallucination. Oh, as though that meant so much, and they are so proud, a dream. What is a dream? And is not our life a dream? I will say more. Suppose that this paradise will never come to pass. That I understand. Yet I shall go on preaching it, and yet how simple it is. In one day, in one hour, everything could be arranged at once. The chief thing is to love others like yourself. That's the great thing, and that's everything. Nothing else is wanted. You will find out at once how to arrange it, and yet it's an old truth which has been told and retold a billion times, but it has not formed part of our lives. The consciousness of life is higher than life. The knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness. That is what one must contend against. And I shall, if only everyone wants it, it can all be arranged at once. And I tracked out that little girl, and I shall go on and on. End of the Dream of a Ridiculous Man by Fyodor Dostoyevsky